I think every one of us has uh, built into our bodies what I would call like a baloney meter. Now, a, so, and how does a baloney meter work? Well, you, <laughs> you hear something and you, you say to yourself, what? <laughs> it's baloney. I mean, you don't say it to the person, but you're like, there is no way that's true, right? Am I right? It's just a built-in baloney meter. Uh, I'll give you a case of a, and a baloney meter is like, you're hearing like lame excuses. It's like, that's lame. That's total baloney. There's no way. Uh, so I was thinking about excuses, and I've heard my share of them, and I've given my fair share of lame excuses growing up. Um, but I, we'll reach outside my life and talk about a lame excuse I found in Reader's Digest I find most interesting. Because it's like, and, and, and this is from an article. If you want to read more, it's quite interesting. Uh, this article is entitled, um, 18 Ridiculous Excuses People Have Used to Get Out of Trouble. I think this was a number one. I'll read it to you. Uh, Charles J. Uh, O'Burney, the top aide to Gov New York Governor David uh, Patterson, neglected to file his tax returns for five years. <laughs> well, neglected, quote unquote, according to his attorney, is really the wrong word, I, uh, he said, because, you know, it's not his fault that he didn't pay his taxes. Huh? So the, the, it says him, his, his argument from his lead counsel was this. Uh, he suffers from a medical condition called late filing syndrome. <laughs> now, if you didn't believe in a, in a baloney meter, now you do, right? Because you heard that and you're automatically thinking to yourself, what? Lame. Are you kidding me? Late filing syndrome. Have you ever suffered from that? Now, the attorney said it's related, directly related to depression. Oh, okay. And he says that even though this depression did not stop him from being a highly functional professional or enjoying his social life actively for five years, it did stop him from paying his taxes for five years. So it was a very limited kind of depression. Now, question is, did anybody buy that argumentation from that attorney? And how did that guy pass the bar? I just want to know. Anyway, uh, did anyone buy that? Well, no, because they called the American Psychi Psychiatric Association into uh, the situation. And they asked him a simple, simple question. Is there such a thing uh, in your, you know, list of maladies as, what was it called? Late, Late filing. Syndrome. Yeah, syndrome. Uh, answer? No. Guilty. as charged. Five years you didn't pay your taxes. That excuse is baloney. That doesn't fly. Unbelievable. You know, and you can readily tell that, that is a, that's just a lame excuse. But the thing is, what people do is they take the propensity to offer lame excuses to get out of trouble. They bring that over into theology. That's what they do. Because I've heard all kinds of reasons why people won't follow God, won't listen to God. And so they just drag over their lame excuses into uh, their, their uh, lifestyle is what they do. Uh, and, and if you don't believe that, just all you have to do is read Jesus in Matthew chapter 7, where he says, on judgment day, many, many will say to me in that day, hey, Lord, Lord, in your name, did we not? And they give all their lame excuses. At the judgment seat of God, they argue with him. I find that just absolutely shocking. But uh, there's, a, there's a text, and I'm, remember I told you I'm paving the way for Romans 10? So just, if you're new, it's going to take a few seconds. I've been gone for five weeks, Okay. <laughs> So show grace and mercy. It's from God. All right. Uh, there's a passage in, in the Gospels where it's an excuse par excellence. Um, it comes from Luke 16, uh, and it's from the, uh, the story. It's not a parable. He doesn't introduce it as a parabolic story. Christ introduces it as a historical account of the rich man and Lazarus. They both die. Uh, the, the rich man does not go to heaven. He goes to Hades. The poor man goes straight to Abraham's bosom, place of great intimacy. He goes right to heaven. And in between uh, heaven and Hades are, is a chasm of which you cannot cross. And those who are in Hades can see into heaven across the chasm. Imagine. That's an interesting passage to study in detail. And as the rich man is there, shocked that he's there, he sees into heaven and he sees Abraham and he sees Lazarus, who used to sit outside the compound of his mansion. And he says this, I beg you, Father Abraham, that you send him, Lazarus, to my father's house. Why? I have five brothers. That he may warn them, lest they come to this place of torment. He's still giving orders, even in heaven, isn't he? Or even in, in Hades, isn't he? Isn't it amazing? I mean, you take your sin nature with you there. He can see into heaven in the middle of all the flames. He's burning, but he's not consumed. And he can see the glory of heaven. And, and Lazarus, of all people, is there. And he says, I want you to send him back to earth so he can warm my whole family. Because I'm shocked I'm here. I mean, how did I wind up here? I didn't know this place was here. Verse 29, Abraham says to him, they, 
your family, have two things. What do they have? Moses and the prophets. Translated in Hebrew vernacular, this, they have the entire Old Testament. Uh, he, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. But he said, no, translated, you don't get it. Uh, Father Abraham, uh, but if someone goes to them from the dead, then they'll repent. So would you just like hurry him along? Uh, but he said to him, if they will not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded if someone rises from the dead. They'll come up with all kinds of excuses. Well, Lazarus wasn't really dead. He only appeared to be dead. And, you know, he just, he was, he was passed out. And when we thought he was dead, we put him in the tomb, but he wasn't really, you know, blah, blah, blah. They're not going to listen. So Abraham tells him, they're having this discussion between heaven and Hades on, I could send somebody back from the dead and then he still won't believe because their unbelief is that, is that deep. Won't do it. The rich man's excuse is the most interesting. I mean, I, I of all people shouldn't be here. I mean, I should be over there. Why am I here? Why didn't I get to go to heaven? I mean, I had all that opulence and money and I did all the things. I was beneficent and the things that I did, but he did not follow God. He did not have a faith relationship with God. That's why he didn't wind up in heaven. But his excuses don't hold water when he winds up there. This is what people do. They uh, uh, devise excuses to keep God at bay. And Paul's going to address excuses when we get to chapter 10, verse 14, of Jewish people, uh, the, the questions that they pose. Because uh, chapters 9, 10, and 11 all deal with Paul talking to his Jewish people because he's, he wants them to come to know Christ as the Messiah. And so as we've studied by way of review, and I haven't got to chapter 10, verse 14 yet, you're still with me, correct? Uh, as we look at the questions, we've entertained five questions that Jews typically asked Paul because he taught all over the known world in synagogues. He had heard every kind of Jewish question. He used to pose them himself. And so we've gone through five questions so far that Paul entertains in the Roman church from the Jewish section of the church uh, as to, well, if we're justified by faith, Paul, then what does that mean about the Torah where God says we've got to obey the law? And if we're justified by faith, Paul, does that mean that God's done with Israel? Because you're telling us, like you just told us uh, in chapter uh, 10, verses uh, 9 and following, that if we, anybody confesses Jesus as the Lord, he then saves them, Jew or Gentile. Does, does that mean he's done with Israel as a people? I mean, what's the deal, Paul? Well, Paul's going to entertain question six. And the thing is, if you have questions for God, he's got answers. He's got definite answers. The question is, you have to come to terms with the answers by faith and embrace them to be saved. So Paul is going to look at, as we're going to see today, at question number six, which are, uh, it's, a, it's a concept that the Jews in the Roman church posed to Paul. And if you can say to yourself this morning, wow, I'm so glad Marty's talking about Jews today, not me, because I'm a Gentile. I am off the hook. Uh, no, you're not. Because the same concepts that apply to the Jew in Paul's context are applicable to you if you are what they call a goyim, a goy. Uh, uh, goyim is plural for Gentile. Uh, Paul's going to uh, entertain their question. What is the question? Hey, Paul, what if Jewish people had no idea, you know, like the rich man, that, that salvation is through faith in Christ and not loyalty to the law, the Torah? I mean, what, if, what happens if they were just clueless? When you stand before the judgment bar of God and you've rejected Christ as Messiah, do you think the argument of being clueless is going to work? No. Paul says that's a really weak argument. So Paul is like an attorney dissecting their arguments, their excuses, their lame excuses. And just as a side note, I would just challenge you, if you don't know Christ as Savior, you have to ask yourself, what are my excuses for rejecting him that I constantly use or throw out to Christians? Uh, my question to you is simple. If you wind up not in God's presence, but like the rich man, will those excuses satisfy you for eternity? They shall not. So Paul says there's a lot to talk about here when he's talking to the Jewish people. He's going to answer their questions in a threefold format. So he's going to tell them, first of all, uh, you Jews have heard the gospel. You cannot say you don't know what we're talking about. Notice what he says in verse 14. Now, if you look at verses 14 uh, through 15a, not the last part of the verse, um, each part of this verse uh, starts with the word how. I highlighted it in yellow uh, because it's the first word in the Greek text. Uh, and it's an interrogative, uh, and it's placed out of word order to, if you're a Greek speaker, this is like a speed bump. And you hit this thing, it's like, whoa, what, what, what's that about? He's making you focus on each one of these arguments to basically say, is it valid or is it invalid? So what, what were the Jewish arguments? Well, um, 
How then, Paul, and by the way, let's just review for a second in case you were new. Go back to, uh, if you have your Bible, go back and look at uh, Romans 10 verse 9. Where Paul just contextually said, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, divine Lord, and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, what's the effect? You'll be saved. For with the, uh, with the heart one believes and is justified by faith. Uh, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will, will not be put to shame. Everyone, Jew and Gentile. Gentile. And they're listening to this going, Paul, uh, hey, suppose we haven't really heard about that gospel that saves Gentiles too by faith. So here's their argument. How then shall they call upon him, they, they as the Jews, how shall they, the Jews, call upon him in whom they've not believed? I mean, how can they do it, Paul? Uh, how shall they believe in him who they've not heard? They haven't heard about him, Paul. Uh, how shall they hear about it? They need a preacher. Uh, and how shall they preach unless they are sent? And then Paul tacks on at the end of that, just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring glad tidings and good things. Uh, let's talk about this. What, is, what does he do when he looks at their questions? Uh, their questions are interesting. They're, they're a chain. Uh, that If you look at these four clauses, the verb of the first clause is repeated in the, in the second clause. And the second clause verb is repeated in the third verb of the third clause. They tie this together intricately. Why? He, Paul's saying, let me build this like an attorney. This point relates to this one, relates to this one, relates to this one. They all hang together, your questions. He says, is your argument valid or invalid that you've never heard about the gospel? And before we get into that, you probably already thought I was into it. I'm not into it yet. Uh, before we get into what Paul's arguing there, I just want to say as a sidelight, what their argument basically shows you that Paul presents is the way you get saved. So let's reverse the order and talk about how a person gets saved. There's four steps, basically, when Paul, Paul says. Number one, you have to have a preacher, right? You have to have a preacher uh, who is sent, right? So the word for preacher here is kind of a, not a great translation. It's the Greek word keruso, and it means to proclaim. So it's, a, it's like a proclaiming, it's a Greek word used for like proclaiming a military victory in Greek, like from a general. Uh, they would send out a herald who would be the, he would give the Caruso the message of victory. So you have to have a preacher or a herald. So don't just think to get saved, you have to have a preacher lead you to Christ. Right? How many here were told about Christ by somebody that, who wasn't a preacher? <laughs> See, you don't need me. I can be off for five more weeks. <laughs> no, a preacher, can, a preacher can give you the gospel, can he not? Sure, I do. But you don't have to have a preacher in the sense of a person who's paid to preach. It just means herald, someone who tells you, your mother, your father, somebody, that Christ died for your sins. Number two, that preacher must be, uh, proclaim a gospel message to the lost. What the gospel? What is the gospel? Christ came, he died, he rose again the third day after he defeated sin and death. Uh, he now calls all sinners to come to him to be saved. That's the good news. He saves sinners. You have to have a message. Number three, the lost learn about the personal work of Christ. And four, they are, have the responsibility to believe or to reject it. Those are the four steps. Now back to what Paul's talking about in the passage. The Jewish argument we'll review is pretty simple. Suppose, Paul, that a Christian herald never told us about the mission of the Messiah. I mean, suppose, so that we could confess him as Lord and Savior. And then surely, by way of implication, if we didn't know about all this, then how could a good, wise, loving God judge us and send us to, uh, to Hades and not to heaven? I mean, how could that happen? Notice what Paul says in verse 15 to rebut their argument. Uh, what does he say and at the end of verse 15? How beautiful are the feet of those who bring glad tidings of good things. He just quotes from the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 52, verse 7, which is a messianic text. Uh, which uh, had near and far fulfillment built into it. Uh, uh, near fulfillment was the promise that uh, Jerusalem one day uh, would be freed from Babylonian captivity. In Isaiah's day, they weren't in captivity yet. But the promise was one day, someone's going to come to you with dirty feet and sandals on and tell you, you are free from Babylonian captivity. You're not going to care on that day in captivity how dirty the person's feet are, right? You're just going to say, those are the best pair of sandals I have ever seen. That guy that walked all across the sand to come tell us we are free. They were free from captivity in 539 BC. Uh, if you study history by Cyrus, king of Persia. Somebody came and told the Jews, you can go back to your homeland, you're free. 
But the far fulfillment is a denotation of the Christ uh, who brings the gospel. And wonderful are his feet that bring the gospel. Anybody who brings the gospel to a lost person comes with feet bearing awesome news of redemption for sinners. So Paul says, you can never say that you've not heard about the gospel because just as God gave proclamations of de deliverance from the Babylonian captivity, he has given you evidence of freedom from spiritual slavery through the gospel. When did he do that? Uh, Acts chapter two, when the church was born at Pentecost, uh, Peter was there. Uh, and Peter preached a powerful message in Acts chapter 2. His, his message was about the miraculous actions of Jesus, Acts 2.22, that his death and his resurrection were historical uh, in, in Acts chapter uh, 2, verses 23 to 24, in his first sermon to the Jews. And then in Acts chapter 2, verse 33, in his message, he says this to the Jews at Pentecost, thousands of them, therefore, having been exalted, Jesus, to the right hand of God, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he's poured forth this which you both see and hear. What were they seeing and hearing? Well, these Jews had come from all over the known world to observe Pentecost, and they all spoke different languages. So if somebody spoke uh, Greek, this guy might have spoke, you know, something else, German, whatever. They could not communicate with each other. But the miracle of Pentecost was, the Greek in uh, Acts chapter 6 is the word dialectos. Sounds a lot like dialect. All of a sudden, somebody who could not speak the, a foreign language could speak and tell them about the Messiah in their language, even though they never knew that language. See, that was the testimony of Pentecost. Only God could reverse Babel, and he did in a powerful way. That's a whole other sermon series. He says, Peter told you flat out who Jesus was. He was the Messiah, and you crucified him, but now you must repent. That's what he says in verse 38 of Acts chapter 2. He tells them, what should you do? Repent. Repent, uh, and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and then you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He will then seal you as his child. Do you want that? Paul says, you've heard. You cannot say that you have never heard about the gospel because Peter told you about it. Paul did it constantly as he traveled from synagogue to synagogue. He always, read Acts. He went into all the synagogues and reasoned about the Christ. So who told you about the Christ? Have we done this yet? It's been three sermons. I'm starting to lose track. Did we do this yet? Who told you about? No, we didn't do this yet. You try to do this three times in a row and be, be over 60 years old. What did I talk about? Who led you to Christ? Who told you? So just, so it's not total mayhem. Who, who told you? So that you are without excuse on the day of judgment. Who, who told you? So just raise your hand. I'll just point to you. Who told you about Jesus? Leslie Dunaway in my high school. Uh, in high school. Was it like a friend? Friend. A, friend. a friend told you. Anyone else? Other than the front row. We can move back. <laughs> this is your chance at the back to get in on the action. The, your mother told you. Thank you. Who else? Parents. Parents told you? And they're here today. Sunday school teacher? Who else? Young life. Young life told you? As they've told many high school students. You, you said your grandmother? Your grandmother told you? Who else? Friend. A friend? Youth leader? Pastor? Pastor? A pastor told you? Yeah. See? See, you, you can say on judgment day, I heard the gospel and I received that gospel and that gospel saved me. But then you have some of those who hear the gospel and they reject that message. See? Yeah, my mother, my mother told me about that, but hey, you know, I don't, yeah, whatever. Or my husband got saved and it's just a religious phase I think he was going through. I didn't want any of that. So you push it away. Paul says you, you don't have any excuse once you hear the gospel. So you can translate it this way. It's dangerous to sit in church. Why? You connect the dots. Am I pretty clear on how I tell you about things? Probably too candidly, but, but, I, 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 but you know, I tell you, if you reject Christ, it's judgment. If you embrace him, it's salvation. I mean, it's pretty simple. And, and you're responsible for your decision. And so it's dangerous to listen to a pastor or a teacher or a grandmother or a godly mother or a godly husband tell you about the gospel of Christ because then you are culpable for your decision in eternity. I'm just saying. Number two, Paul says, uh, well, you have heard about the gospel, so you can't say you haven't heard. And then he says, you Jews willfully chose to reject the gospel. Now think about it. If you know something to reject it, then you can't say, I didn't know it. You follow? See, they're saying, we, we, suppose we had no idea. Are you kidding me? Paul's baloney meter is like pegged. He's like, are you kidding me? There's no way. Notice what he says in verse 16. 
He says, but not all the Israelites accepted the good news. For he says, Isaiah says, quote, Lord, who has believed our message? Unquote. He's quoting from Isaiah now, chapter 53. Obviously, Paul, quoting from Isaiah, loved Isaiah. He's quoting from Isaiah 53, which is a fantastic prophecy of the Messiah. I mean, it's an amazing prophecy where he goes into great detail, Isaiah does, uh, some 800 years before Christ to tell you when the Messiah shows up, he's going to bear the sins of the people. Uh, he will be the sacrificial lamb when he shows up. It's part of his mission. Paul says, you can look at the book of Isaiah and say, God specifically told us how he was going to redeem us. And he says, uh, he said so in Isaiah chapter 53. I remember uh, after Liz's sister, her twin sister passed away in 93. Um, uh, and I did the funeral and uh, it was at my house. Uh, my Jewish sister-in-law, that side of the family, you know, she was, came over and we were sitting on the back patio. I was out there with Martha. And uh, for the first time in her life, she opened the window to her life. And she said to me, as we sat on the patio, how could you possibly believe as a Gentile that Jesus is the Messiah? What's that proof? And I said, well, I won't even use the New Testament. I'll just use your books. Let's start in the Torah and then we'll work our way to the prophets. We had a long conversation. We wound up in Isaiah 53. When I got done explaining Isaiah 53 to her about the mission of Christ, the Messiah, to be our Savior, to bear our sin, she looked at me and she said, I have never heard these things before. This is amazing. She never did anything with the evidence. Still today. Remember, free will. I, I'm a preacher. I can just tell you, here's the, here's, the, here's the food. Here's the evidence. You're responsible to embrace. But historically, the Jewish people have rejected the message. Paul says, not all the Israelites accepted the good news. That's kind of an understatement. Because as a nation, they have historically pushed back against the work of the Messiah and the word of God. Jeremiah chapter 44, verse 4, gives you an illustration of how a prophet, Isaiah said, not many people believed our report, Lord. And I, Jeremiah comes along later and says in chapter 44, verse 4, speaking for God, as the nation's going to go into exile, uh, what does God say to the people who did not listen to his prophets? He says, I, I sent to you my servants, the prophets. How many times? Again and again. And what did those prophets say? Uh, what, again, what, what, what was said? Uh, well, they said, don't do this abominable thing, which I hate. Does God hate things? According to our culture, he doesn't. Oh, yeah, he does. If you say God does not hate and it's, it's not Christian to hate, you not, have not read the Bible. Because that which is contrary to God, that which is unholy and is evil, Scripture says he hates that which is evil. And here he says, these are the abominable things which I hate. And then he lists one thing that he hates. They sacrificed uh, uh, even their children to false gods. They worshiped false gods. God says, I hate idol worship. I hate it. Now, hate in and of itself can be uh, erroneous. I mean, it can be placed in the wrong object from something that God loves. But God says, I'm holy and there's things that I find abominable. When does a nation begin to fall? When nothing is abominable. When nothing's sinful. When that which is sinful becomes that which is acceptable. Uh, when the pastors, the preachers, the saints do not speak for truth anymore. See, that's what Jeremiah says. God, let me be your voice. We have told the people again and again they're going to go into captivity if they don't stop doing the sin they do. They did not listen because their penchant was as a people to constantly walk against God's message. That's why Paul says, you cannot say that you've never heard the gospel and you cannot say that you don't know what God was doing because you willfully heard the message when Jesus was here, when Peter preached, when I preached, and you've rejected it constantly, constantly. What did Paul do in his ministry? Acts chapter 18. Uh, when he was in Corinth, notice what he did when he was in Corinth. It says uh, he was reasoning in the synagogue how often? Every Shabbat, every Sabbath. What was he trying to do there? To persuade the Jews and the Greeks. But when Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul began devoting himself clearly to the word, solemnly testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah, the Christ, the Christos. And when they had resisted, they, they blasphemed and they shook out their garments. And they said, he said to them, your blood be upon your own heads, hands. I am, I am clean. Why? Because I told you who the Messiah is. What did they do to him? Well, the same thing that they do to people who speak truth. They resist verbally and blaspheme and, and curse at the person giving the good news. Paul says, uh, if that's where you're at, I can't talk to you anymore. 
But he said, I've given you the evidence of the Christ and you've pushed back against that. You have to ask yourself, Jews did that. Jews still do that today. So do Gentiles. They hear the message of the gospel and they push back against that gospel. That might be you. Paul's telling you, it's time to stop pushing back against the gospel, resisting it and to embrace it by faith. The third thing that he said is the Jewish excuses for rejecting Christ basically don't hold water. He's gonna go through two excuses. One he's already talked about and another one he hasn't talked about. And why would he go over something he's already talked about before? Why is he forgetful? Uh, I would say because some sin dies hard. And so he's gonna go back over the argument that he already talked about to make sure they really get it. What's their excuse? Well, that we Jews, Jews truly had no idea about Christ's person and work. We didn't know what he was gonna do. Are you kidding me? Because your, your Torah and your uh, prophets tell you exactly what he was going to do. Notice verse 18. But I say, surely they have never, as a people, heard, have they? I mean, is it possible they never heard? What's Paul's rebuttal? Indeed, what? They have. They have. He then quotes Psalm 19. Their voice has gone out, verse 4. Their voice has gone out into all the world, earth and their words to the ends of the world. If you study Psalm 19, this is verse 4, but Psalm, 9, one, uh, Psalm 19 is about, how do you know there's a God? What does the, the psalmist say? You just need to look up at the heavens. What do they tell you? That intricacy, that structured timing of everything based on rotation and all the complexities shows you the greatness of God. It's called general revelation. And Paul says, Think about it this way. If the God who speaks to you through, spe through general revelation, through the complexity of the cosmos to point to him, the great complex one, then don't you think that he would tell you about the gospel through special revelation? The answer is yes. But ge general revelation is awesome, isn't it? I mean, it points to God. And basically what Psalm, ni Psalm 19 is all about is, is the evidence this is for God built into the warp and woof of the cosmos. Uh, these are called the teleological and the cosmological arguments. Are you ready? Telos is the Greek word for the end, for design. Um, how does that syllogistic argument go? Specify complexity or irreducible complexity. Like if you have a mousetrap, do you need all the components for it to actually work? Can it evolve into different components over millions of years and still be a mousetrap? No. No, it's irreducible complexity. You need the spring, the bait, the wood, the everything to make it work. It's irreducible complexity. It has an intelligent designer, even a mousetrap. Uh, two, life has specified complexity. Boy, doesn't it? Like your circulatory system, your eye, your brain, etc. cetera. Um, hence, what's the conclusion of the argument? Human life, common sense, shows there's just an intelligent designer. I mean, it's common sense. That's Psalm 19. Uh, uh, there's another way to look at the teleological argument. Uh, we won't look at it today because I want to tell you about the cosmological argument, cause effect. Behind every eff effect, there's a cause. So here's how this works. Everything that begins had a cause, right? Everything. We can't get out of the chain of cause and effect. The universe had a beginning. We know that from the two laws of thermodynamics, right? Everything's winding down. All energy's being used up. Why? Well, it used to be wound up tighter, more energy, etc. The universe had a beginning. They even call it the big what? Bang. So if there's a big bang, there must be a big banger. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> so the universe had a beginning. Number three, therefore the universe, logically, common sense would tell you it had a cause. But wait a minute. So if I can't go back into time in infinite regression on a chain of cause and effect, because there, nothing self-caused, right? So by definition, it tells me there has to be somebody outside of cause and effect who's not caused, who made causation. God that's why I'm a Christian. It's a logical choice. That's Psalm 19. Oh, there's more to this. Point two. It's called the horizontal argument of cosmological argument. Something exists. I do. You do. You're sitting there, right? Are you there? Okay. Number two, nothing cannot produce something. That's the truth. Three, therefore, something exists eternally and necessarily. There, uh, you know. And I am not necessary as an eternal being since I can change you know, I'm not God. I'm, I'm, I'm dependent. So therefore, uh, both God, a necessary being, uh, who's purely actualized and was not created, uh, and I, a contingent being, exist. By definition, it has to be that way. Because I can, I, there, I cannot exist, and one day I won't exist, right? But God is always in a state of existence. He has to be in that. So when he, 
I was reading in my Hebrew Bible the other day on my iPad, coming back, uh, Exodus chapter 3. I love it in Hebrew. I just love to read it because it's just so, ah, oh, it's just amazing to read what he says there. But when, when, Ab when Moses asked God, okay, I, I've seen you on the mount, uh, I've seen you in the burning bush, like I need a name. What's your name? What's God tell him? My name's I am. My name's a verb. It's a present tense verb. It's perpetual. I'm outside of cause and effect. I created it all. I'm the uncreated one. I'm a necessary being. You're a contingent being. I'm purely actualized. You're actualized by your mom and dad. No one made me. I am. What's that got to do with Paul's argument in Romans 10? Everything. Everything. He said, do you think the God who built into the fabric of the cosmos tells you he's there is not going to tell you how to find him through his son? Sure, he's told you. Lame excuse to say that he hasn't given you enough information. Excuse number two. Let me close with this. Uh, we Jews did not understand the message when we got it about Jesus. Really? Really? Verse 19. He says, but I surely say, surely Israel did not know, did they? I mean, can they claim that we had no clue? We didn't get it? We didn't understand it? Paul's rebuttal is uh, very interesting. He says, uh, at, at, at the first Moses says, quote, uh, I will make you jealous as a people by that which is not a nation. By a nation without understanding, I will anger you. He quotes uh, Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 21. Before Moses died, he sang a song to Israel. Before he died. This is the song that he sang, that chapter. Re read it. It's an amazing chapter. Because in uh, verses 4 to 9 and verses 19 to 27, in the song that the old man sang to his people, he reminded them that you as a people constantly walk away from the things of God. See, this was a couple thousand years before Christ. They had a penchant for walking away from God. So for them to say, uh, we had no clue about this gospel message. He said, I'm going to tell you through the pen of Moses uh, that he had a plan. Because if you read Deuteronomy 32, God promised the great reversal that if you as a people do not listen to the voice of his prophets, he will go to another people with his gospel. Who'd he go to? Gentiles. Gentiles. And that's exactly what he said. He said, you can't say that you did not know he was going to save Gentiles by faith. He quotes from Deuteronomy to do that. Then he quotes from Isaiah again uh, in chapter 65 of Isaiah in verse 20. He says, Isaiah is very bold when he says, I was found by those who did not seek me and I became manifest to those who did not ask for me. Who are those people? Gentiles. He said, I gave you Jews the Torah, the prophets, and I spoke to you through amazing ways through the Old Testament. And you did not embrace the gospel that I gave you. And you rejected that. So he said, what happened? A people who wasn't even looking for me found me. The Gentiles. He said, don't tell me. He said, from, I, from the Torah to the prophets, it was clear that I was going to save Gentiles by faith. Did their excuses fly? No. Full of holes. Full of holes. I have to ask you, what was Paul attempting to do? He's trying to win them to Christ. That's what he was trying to do. I had a Messianic Jew come up and talk to me after the last service saying how, I think it took him 20 years to come to Christ. And his wife sat there and told me, she said, I prayed for my husband for 20 years. And he finally embraced Christ. Amazing. Now that, now that man's ready to stand before God because he knows the Christ. Are you ready? Your excuses will not hold up on judgment day. Far better to be clothed by the blood of Christ. Uh, Tuesday, I buried my uh, late uncle, my uncle Tony. Tony Sanchez. Here's a picture of my Uncle Tony. Uh, he was from uh, near Barcelona, Spain. Uh, he was a farmer in California. Uh, his family came over, uh, I don't know, 1915, 1920, something like that. Uh, he, they had, he had a beautiful life. His little mom, uh, she, I remember her when I was a kid. Uh, wherever they would farm in California, she would uh, draw lines outside the city limits uh, back in the 20s and 30s and say, I think, the, I think the towns will grow here. So she bought acreage out there all up and down the state of California. Guess what happened? <laughs> Everybody moved to California. And they ended up selling all that land by the square foot. Uh, so he was, he, he was wealthy because of real estate. He was wealthy because of farming. But he was a very humble man, was he not, Liz? I mean, the epitome of humility was my uncle. You would never know in a million years that he was worth major money. This is a kind man, a giving man. So when I did his funeral um, uh, Tuesday, uh, his friends were there. And I, I, most of his friends I've known all my life. So there was attorneys there and judges there and other farmers there. and They were all there. 
And uh, I brought the message about a life that was well prepared to meet God. But how did my uncle come to know God? Well, he, uh, my, my aunt passed away uh, from breast cancer in uh, 88. So he was a, a widower all those years. And um, he, one time in the late 70s, he went with my aunt uh, over, I think it was the Oakland Coliseum. They went to a Billy Graham crusade. He, he walked in. Uh, a man financially well off. He didn't think he needed God. And he went in spiritually dead. And at the time when Billy Graham gave the altar call, uh, there was a, a Spaniard who went down and said, I need to be saved. And he was. The best thing he ever did. Isn't that amazing? He was ready. He took all of his excuses for not trusting Christ and laid him down there at that front of that, you know, Coliseum. And he trusted Christ that night. So when the angels came for him on June 19th, I can tell you who was ready. It was Tony. And he didn't have to have one excuse as to why he should, you know, not be in heaven because he embraced the Christ. You ever done that? You'll never know when God's coming for you. When I was on vacation, I, I read about the story of the angel pitcher, the young man, 27 years old. Uh, what was his name? I'm a Dodger fan, so, you know. Yeah, but I read about that young man who died in his sleep. Yeah, no body fat, total shape. And I thought to myself as I read that, thinking about my uncle and everything, you never know when God's going to come for you. Was that young man ready? My uncle was ready. Uh, I prayed for you this week, if you don't know Christ, that you would lay your excuses down at his feet and he shall save you for all, I, all eternity. May that happen for you today. Let's pray. God, thank you just for the wonder of the gospel of Christ uh, that you can take a sinner, wash away the sin at the moment of confession, and make them your child. You can do that uh, for a, a young man at 27, an old man at 91, doesn't matter. You can redeem and save and give them life. We pray for anybody in our church that has got their fortified list of excuses as to why they don't trust you. Might those excuses be laid down at your feet today at the foot of your bloodstained cross and may they say, God save me this day and you shall. Thank you for who you are in the name of Christ. Amen.